Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode we're going to start off with launching a mission to Saturn. We don't really have a custom Saturn mission so we're going to launch a version of the Jovian 1 on a Nico 411B and I'm just gonna have that roll out now. It's gonna take a day and a half and our Saturn transfer window is in two days and a half. I've also designed a Jupiter orbiter on the Nico 2544, so this is something with a lot of delta V, or at least as much as I could put on the Nico 2544, which is a lot. I mean, I think it's like 22,000 meters per second uh, on that, and we, we could really use some more efficient engines, frankly, for the upper stages. Right now, it's got, uh, what you got, the Asterisk uh, 2s on the upper two stages and then we've got a S4 stage with the RL10s but they're really still uh, crappy-ish RL10s so but yeah we, we've got that as a possibility but um, I don't know we've got this Venus window I'm tempted to send this Jupiter orbiter not to any outer planet but actually to Venus first and then maybe swing by Venus and see if Venus could slingshot us to something else not sure Let's see, how long would the Jupiter orbiter take? Uh, 59 days it looks like, which would definitely miss the Venus window. Venus is not like the outer planets. You really have to hit the window pretty close. So, yeah, maybe maybe we'll pass on that and wait for the next Venus window. Or we, maybe we could reserve the Jupiter orbiter for Uranus, which would be a interesting thing. But the trouble with Uranus is if we go direct instead of slingshotting by Jupiter, uh, it takes forever. So, yeah, our delay of gratification will be pretty severe. So there is that. But, yeah, maybe we should just focus on the Kelly 3 and our moon landing mission first. Since we now have a contract and that's in 166 days, we should probably work on that. Alright, but first, the Saturn mission. Alright, so here we are, and of course we are somewhat planning for the fact that we're eventually going to get the Voyager transfer window, right? Which has the great benefit of being able to swing by Jupiter and then going to Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And uh, so with our interplanetary probes we're sort of developing towards that so that we don't just do Voyager. We will attempt to do something far more impressive than Voyager, but we have a lot of testing to do before that. Voyager, of course, launched on a relatively small rocket. We can do something far more substantial if we launch on a Nico 2544 or something like that. So that is the hope. And so here we go, probably a fleet of different rockets. We've got the budget for it. All right, so throttle up, SAS is on. And well, actually, before I do that, let's make sure that we minimize any sort of residual inclination we're gonna get. Now, if we can swing by Jupiter, I'll do that, but chances are Saturn is too far behind for a Jupiter slingshot to be feasible. So here's Saturn, and hmm, I could have sworn that we had just done a Jupiter transfer like a little while ago, but no, Jupiter's totally in the wrong place anyway. So cancel that idea. It's just straight to Saturn. Not the most convenient way to go. But yeah, since we know that the ideal window would be coming up in like 1977-ish, probably it makes no sense to try and uh, hope for it right now. Okay, well, here we go. Ignition. And launch. Got a bit of a staging issue right there. Well, at any point, test flight can make our lives miserable. We saw that with the station launch, of course. I think before we launch the Kelly 3, we should have a backup mission just in case. Ready to be launched. So. Ah, uh, we've lost one engine. Uh, that can cause some problems, especially since we haven't actually reached max Q yet. Let's 
try and uh, work with it. I might have to take manual control. Well, still plugging away, but we're too shallow. So somebody asked why I wasn't using KOS, and that's because uh, KOS might be able to handle test flight. It might have been able to handle this engine lost fine. I, I think it could have. But there's also a chance that because it's not really built to respond to the loss of an engine, that it would try to keep the pitch too high and then eventually flip out the rocket. Alright, getting ready for the end of the first stage. Uh, we get those wiggles right at the end for some reason. Set and ignition. I just fundamentally don't understand why that happens. Maybe we should shut down the engines short of their ending, but I mean, it's not like they're hitting especially high g-forces at that point. So yeah, I really don't get it. Why? I mean, it's like systematic. Uh, you got five seconds left, start wiggling. Don't understand that at all. Alright, I think we can release the fairing. And that allows us to actually see the stage delta V in stage time. Okay, let me thrall down because it started the wiggly thing. Pretty early too. Not e I mean, it's like barely getting to 2 G's. And separation. I've made sure we're at full throttle. We may want a bit more up angle. We're barely gonna make orbit on this stage as it is though. Start getting some antennae out. Okay, here we are making orbit. Five seconds. And this will actually re enter. We'll have to use the centaur stage for just a little burst. So, set and ignition. So, mild use of the centaur stage to actually complete orbit. And shut down. 195 by 183. All right, time for me to try and plot to Saturn. Okay, well, I'm being plagued by quite a lot of possibilities. So you here, you see here, this is a actually a retrograde pass at at Saturn, and there's a reason I'm going that way because it seems to yield quite a lot of possibilities. Downside is we can't really hit Titan like this, but if you zoom out. And you can see, I think we still have probe fuel locked, so we're just barely within our regular fuel margin. And if you see the resulting path, we end up hitting Neptune in 25 years. That's harsh, but you know, that's interesting too. So uh, five years to Saturn and then another 20 years to Neptune. But it's so touchy. Um, here, that's a 0.1 meter per second difference. But note, okay, and then here, there's another possibility. Okay, I just uh, maneuvered it by uh, 0.1 here and there, and that's a pretty close chance at Uranus. I mean, if we wait till later on, we could probably manage that, fine-tune it a bit more. We're a little bit too far from Saturn to fine-tune it right now. But at the same time, so that's Neptune. That's a potential Uranus thing. And then here, this this says that this is going to bring us back into Jupiter. Uh, but that's only if we miss Saturn. It's, it's claiming that we're missing Saturn now. We're not missing Saturn. Uh, if you take a look here, we're definitely hitting Saturn, Saturn's SOI at least. Uh, pretty close, I mean, we're right in there. Uh, 180,000 kilometers is very close to Saturn, closer than Voyager got, I think. And then here it says we're missing completely. 
and then if we go out a uh, few more it, we're hitting it again so it's it's lying to us when it says that we're missing Saturn in between those two numbers but yeah if we miss Saturn we end up hitting Jupiter is what it claims um, he liked that I think a uh, Uranus pass is likely but then again there's also a Neptune possibility now if we pass by Uranus chances are Uranus is going to give us too much of a boost uh, to safely hit Neptune I don't know and uh, I, I would think that Uranus's extra ga gravitational assist would like push us past Neptune but Neptune is a big big gas giant too in its own right so there's a chance this could work out but yeah I mean it's not even showing the resulting line properly here look at that that it's uh, having us uh, shoot out like that I don't know what that is actually uh, it's showing us an encounter but it's showing our so it's not really wanting to calculate any of this at all at this particular juncture um, you can see that there's uh, quite a normal component to our burn and that's uh, to fix any sort of inclination issues uh, uh, basically it would have taken like 7100 uh, otherwise if it was just pure prograde and then with the normal component that adds about 1100 net to the whole thing okay well I'm going to have to figure out how to do this burn efficiently it looks like it's going to take uh, practically all of our Delta V uh, in these two stages not including the probes own fuel so that means that it's going to take 15 minutes let's say 15 minutes to do the burn hmm uh, it's not really advisable to do the burn in two separate things because we are going to um, we will be too quickly on escape anyway so then we'll be delaying quite a lot in earth orbit and our fuel will boil off so we can't really do that you know what though considering that the stages are pretty much half and half for our, our intended delta V for the burn I guess we would aim to finish up the RL10 stage on one side of the burn and then do the remainder of the burn with the asterisk 2 I think that's the I mean uh, but it's it's a little bit more than half the RL10 stage so I guess we would want to start to burn at 6 minutes and 45 seconds you won't believe how touchy this is when it comes to the timing of this so yeah 6 minutes and 45 seconds seems like a good way to go and so that's when we'll ignite the RL10s maybe 6 minutes 50 okay well let's time warp of course our stages got destroyed that's what those notifications were about Okay, getting close to when we need to ignite. It's a little bit off from the node. Alright, ignition. It'll take some time for it to spool up and get back to the node. Alright, well, could I die more precisely? Maybe, but this, this has got to be pretty close. I'm uh, obviously hoping that we don't dip below the atmosphere, but we are definitely going to take advantage of the Oberf effect. Distance to target 2.796 terameters. Haven't seen that one in this uh, this series yet. Okay, we are hitting our absolute periapsis right now. 154,270 kilometers it was. So that's pretty darn close to the atmosphere, but not in it. That uh, that starts at 140. So 154 was our minimum periapsis. Pretty darn close. All right, we are on escape. The Centaur stage has so far performed nominally, and we're getting ready for its conclusion. I am going to unlock the fuel up here we are past the node and set and ignition
Thank goodness we didn't have a loss of communication or anything. And eight minutes on this stage. It looks like we're just barely making it, but I think if we follow the node precisely now, we'll actually overshoot. I suspect so. We'll see. I'll have to watch things. Some numbers are not being very precise right now, that's for sure. Okay, well now it's indicating that we're way short. Of course, we still have fuel in the probe, so don't panic. But it isn't looking great as far as these numbers are concerned. We're getting close though, we're past the orbit of Jupiter. Nope, not gonna quite make it on the asterisk stage. And that's the end of that. Okay, well, I won't get rid of the node. I will get rid of the stage. Well, not really an imbalance of fuel, so that's good at least. I didn't want to see that. Okay, we probably didn't need solar panels on this stage, all things considered. Separation. Okay, uh, unlocking fuel. There's no actual engine on this, it's just RCS. So, RCS is on. Let's hope we have enough. But be careful. Oh yeah, this is going to take a while. Okay, well, it's frustratingly persistent about the whole Jupiter thing. So, anyway, let me come out of physical time warp and see. Uh, yeah, it really likes Jupiter. We appear to be passing higher than I wanted. You know what? I think I'll have to exit from Earth SOI in order to get a real read on this. Doesn't look like the moon's in the way or anything. It was uh, for certain trajectories, but not off, not for this one. Okay, yeah, let's just uh, get clear of Earth SOI and see if things solidify. We're ready, quite far out. Alright, so here's the situation. We basically messed up our inclination. We didn't really get close enough to Saturn this time. Certainly not enough to fulfill the contract that we have for Saturn flyby, which requires below 20,000 kilometers. But, if we go like this and span 139 meters per second or so, and we do it very, very carefully, we can get a Uranus encounter in 27 years, it says, which is harsh. And it's sort of like that, because, of course, we didn't flatten out our inclination with Saturn, so once we pass Saturn, it spits us out in a very inclined orbit. Um, I didn't see any possibility of getting to Neptune. Uh, of course, if we wanted to get to Neptune, we'd have to get closer to Saturn, which requires correcting our inclination further. So, I, well, this is a possibility. Since we're not going to fill the Saturn flyby mission, at least we could get some science out of this whole thing. So, uh, 10 days is the node. We'll try and time warp to it and take care of it. Okay, and throttle up. And here begins another RCS burn in order to get closer to Saturn and potentially nab ourselves a Uranus encounter. All right, well, it's sort of indecisive right now, but you can see there's a closest approach here at Uranus, and there we get a Uranus encounter, but it's really hard to see it. And that, there we lose it. So it's touchy, because I'm just doing very brief RCS bursts. So, I guess we'll just have to hope that I can get a curb alarm for this entering Saturn SOI. You can see, hmm, that's not so easy either. Uh, I don't know if that's the right one. Let's see, what's the date on this thing? Six years. Okay, maybe. Alright, so it's it's gotta be a tough one. 
Now we've got this Venus transfer window coming up, but we've also got to do the moon landing. Let me see if I can... Maybe we should just launch one more of these to Venus, though it's a waste to have the RTGs on. Then again, the RTGs and the solar panels, solar panels are pretty expensive too. So maybe it's just better to have RTGs anyway. Let's go to the VAB and check that. Alright, so here we have an RTG, and an RTG produces 0.16 charge per second, which I guess makes it 160 watts. And that's a, a thousand funds. If we take a look at, let's get one that's uh, about the same, that's a, a 0.17 per second. Okay, but we don't have it unlocked, so we can't see how much that's costing. Um, that's a little bit less. This is a little bit more. Uh, 0.18 per second, or 0.19 per second, and it's 450. Now it weighs less, so that's pretty important, but then again it diminishes further away from the sun, so that's not nice, but then again it gets better charge closer to the sun, presumably. So that's better, as, especially if we're talking about a Venus mission. But still 450. So with the, with the, I guess you could say, reliability that the RTG gives you in that you don't have to make sure that the spacecraft is oriented properly towards the sun. You know, we've had a problem with that, though now I understand the persistent rotation and how that works, it might be helpful. But yeah, it's, it's surprising how much the solar panels cost compared to the RTG. The RTG is actually relatively cheap. You're talking about a million dollars in 1960 dollars interesting okay yeah I mean it might be just uh, reasonable to send one of these to Venus I uh, actually what we could do is remove the solar panels from this stage might be helpful they're supplementary because of the controller on that stage we don't really need such a huge rocket though maybe we could just launch a much smaller rocket it's not like we're short of funds Hmm. Okay, so what we have here is a very, very cheap Venus mission. I'm just going to call it Venus 1, and it's the Nico 101. And this is pushing it. This is pushing it. We've reduced the size of the antenna. I've picked this AIES Comtech CM60 dish, which says useful anywhere within the inner planets. Okay. We've got the same instruments, but we've reduced the amount of fuel here and added a 1 kilonewton thruster. Uh, because the RCS was driving me nuts, but we don't have a reaction wheel, so that's a downside because uh, I wanted to reduce the cost and reduce the build time. Uh, we've increased the size of this. this is a Delta Avionics package now, and that's because we have a larger fuel tank here, and actually I wonder if we need the Delta Avionics package. Still, uh, we should probably have it because the Able Avionics package is not very efficient. See 5 tons 150 watts? This one is uh, can take 10 tons and 120 watts, and also the mass is not that different, uh, 0.16 versus 0.14. So it's just, I think, better to have it. And uh, But I think we could do with an Able Avionics package because of the core there. That can deal with 0.6. So total in total, we could, if we put the Able Avionics package, we could have a mass of 5.6. So it's doable, but... Yeah, I think the lower power consumption of... I mean, we're not going to be hanging out with this for very long. It's just going to boost us out to Venus, but you never know. So, yeah, that's the story up there. And then we have a single NK-19 and then a single NK-15. Um, some Someone's probably going to suggest uh, putting an NK-15V instead of an NK-15. So let's just take a look at those stats. NK-15, uh, 297 sea level, 331 vacuum. NK-15V, it's 260 at sea level, sea level, 346 in vacuum. I think this stage is going to spend so long in in some sort of atmosphere that it's not a good idea to put the V on when it has such a low atmospheric ISP. Okay, but it does have the higher uh, vacuum ISP, so that's nice. But yeah, this I think is the best possible setup. Very low thrust weight ratio to start off with. And of course, we're only running one engine on each stage. So if they, if they fail, they fail. We're not going to Venus. 
So it's just a quickie rocket to see if we can build a relatively cheap rocket, right? To 11,548 and still get to where we're supposed to go. So let us pack it up and build one and see if it can do things. That's too big a fairing right there. Okay, so we have a substantial build queue now. We've got the Venus 1 on the Nico 101. That'll be done in 15 days, well in time for our Venus transfer window. We could probably build a backup just in case the first failed, but we do have to watch out for our moon landing deadline of 153 days. So, and we want to have both, uh, we've got two Kelly 3s being built and we want to make sure both are ready so that we have a backup before we launch that mission. We have another Spaceport 1 and that's going to be launching on Nico 606 this time so that if we lose engines we don't have to totally fail. And then also because once we get Spaceport 1 up and running we'll want a, some sort of way of getting crew to it. We are building a Kelly 3 Earth Orbit Edition on a Nico 606, you've seen that before. And then of course our Jupiter Orbiter. So we've got a lot of stuff to build. Maybe it's time to add some points to our second build slot. Um, so VAB upgrades, okay, and yeah, let's let's get some extra points in. Looks like we can more quickly update this one. I wonder to what limit, because I mean it can't always be 0.12 for this one, otherwise eventually this one will overtake that one, right? Maybe it's only when we get to that one, uh, the when we get to rate one that uh, we'll have double points for this one. Let's get halfway. Maybe that should be a goal. Hmm. Well, well uh, it seems like it's gonna be easy to upgrade that second slot. R&D wise uh, we should just throw some more money at it. Okay, and then it'll be 74 more days until we build the backup. But we're ready to launch the Venus rocket, but we can time warp somewhat. Let's give ourselves a day to launch it. Here we go. Okay, we're all lined up. That's sort of a stubby looking rocket. It looks a lot like, like a Minotaur 5 or something like that, you know. Something that's meant to be like a ballistic missile, but it's it's for it's for science. It's for good things. Okay, here we go. Thrall is up. SAS is on and ignition and launch. Well, uh, this is gonna be nail biting. All the way up. Well, we have no roll control, so it's just gonna roll on its own, however it likes. And not so much wobble at the end of this stage either. I was expecting some wobbling, but we're at 3 G's and no wobble. Okay, separation. And ignition. Come on, catch it. This thing's got like 8 degrees of gimbal, so it's pretty good with that. Okay, on we go. We'll probably have to use some of the hypergolic stage, which is, it has the Lunar Gemini lander engines on it, in order to uh, finish orbit. And that's common practice. We've got maybe about 800 meters per second in the probe. That's locked right now. It should be safe and productive to separate fairings now. Now, if it turns out we can do some fancy maneuver at Venus in order to get somewhere else, we'll do it. I mean, right now, we I don't think we have a Venus flyby contract, do we? So we don't have to get below a certain altitude or anything. It's once again just for science. 
Well, we're getting really low. I mean, we're keeping really low around the Earth this time. Don't know if that's the best idea. Fortunately, the Lunar Gemini Lander Engine stage, um, it's got a pretty high thrust weight ratio. It's got more than one anyway. So we don't have to reserve much time to apoapsis here. But we are ending up hugging the atmosphere pretty close. Let's thrall down a bit. Still no wiggles for some reason. I mean, this setup is not all that different from the Jovian one. I guess maybe the um, Astros engine is particularly wiggly. I don't know. Okay, Lunar Gemini. Thank goodness I made sure it was a service module tank. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we do need RCS. They don't have gimbling. That's the downside to them. But I needed more thrust. The asterisk did not provide enough thrust, so that's why I used these. You couldn't fit two asterisks, astri, something like that, on this stage, so. Oh, I throttled down. I was going, why do I have low throttle? Oh, yes. And that's good enough. 213 by 147. Okay, let's just allow it to roll around and let me plot for Venus. Okay, we have a plot for Mars, but it's pretty dodgy. And the main reason is because we're nowhere near one of the nodes. And so we're trying to hit it at a descending node, it actually is. And that's trouble. Uh, it's over there and in 96 days. But that means we have to go faster than normal in order to hit it. And uh, as you can tell, it's not home and transfer because uh, home and transfer we'd hit it over here. And that's in order to make sure we're crossing its orbit at that point in order to have the encounter. Uh, in order to actually correct the inclination, if we were out here, uh, you, know, you know, in uh, solar space, uh, we would need about 1,600 meters per second. It's three degrees off is all. But to correct that three degrees closer to the sun, we would have to use 1,600, which we do not have. Now, currently, we do have enough for this burn because we have the probe's fuel locked, but it's a bare, bare thing. So it's going to be close, and we'll see what happens. This was always going to be a close call mission anyway. We were lucky that neither engine on the launcher failed, but uh, it's, still, it's still a very cheapy mission that we're barely going to be able to fulfill, if at all. And it'll just be a flyby, and it might be just on the edge of Venus's SOI. We've been to Venus before, I think, uh, with the Aphrodite probe. It seems that we have an Aphrodite probe still around, but I don't recall if that was successful or not. But there isn't much opportunity to plan for some special maneuver that would use Venus to boost us somewhere else. And we're not getting close enough to Venus to make that happen anyway. Okay, node, RCS on, and ah, I wish we had the reaction wheel right now, it's rocking back and forth using the RCS, we really don't need that. Okay, unlock these, and separation, and ignition. And we're on escape. You can see we have about uh, 130 meters per second more than we need for this burn. Assuming that the burn is actually going to happen properly. Still skirting right along, very low altitude. Wiggling about. Now, it's fair for this to wiggle. I don't know how precisely it's balanced. It's got those things, that over there and these things over here. Presumably, I got it reasonably balanced, but tough to say. Okay, here we go. Coming close to the end of this. Not much spare fuel at all. 
I'm just going to use RCS here. There's no encounter visible right now. Let's get rid of that. That's getting closer. Okay. Maybe it's safe to give a burst in this direction. Okay, now we have an encounter. Just try and get as close as possible. Fifteen, fourteen. We're just not going to have any extra. Thirteen meters per second left, twelve. Yep. Fortunately, it, it looks like it's actually closer than I plotted, so that's nice. All right, well, that's it. That's all of our fuel. 162,000 kilometers is as close as we're going to get with this one. But it was a cheap mission and full of risks. So I guess we are lucky to get away with that. Built it in 15 days. All right, well, let's get, uh, well, let's get out of SOI. After all, we've got rockets building and then we can add the alarm. Ooh, looks like we're actually passing by the moon. Maybe we should do some science on the way out then. It's a barest encounter with the moon, right at the edge of the moon's SOI. Uh, for those wondering, no, we really couldn't have used the moon for a boost or anything like that. If we, uh, you could use the moon for a boost, but what the only way you're gonna get any good result from that is if you uh, slam into the moon, <laughs> right? Uh, that's the only way it's gonna give you enough of a gravitational assist. Uh, it's sort of frozen here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, uh, you're not gonna get much gravitational assist from not crashing into the moon, but even if you get real, really, really close. We've lost connection. Oh, that's weird. This is active. Delete on close. Hmm. Main dish has the range. We just happen to be facing the location where there's nothing to communicate with. Wow. Hope that doesn't happen at Venus. Okay, we'll wait till periapsis and see if any of our instruments are actually things we haven't done here. I doubt it. Let's check the mag magnetometer. Okay, well actually we haven't done a magnetometer scan high over the moon. So let's transmit that. Let's, I'm sure we did orbital obs uh, visual observations. But maybe it's a different biome? No, we've, we've done it. Okay. And we, we've analyzed telemetry like this before. Yes. The small experiments. Yep, those have all been done. Okay, we are now in solar orbit. And we have our Venus encounter in 92 days. And is it still the same altitude that we had before? Focus view. Yeah, still 162,000 kilometers. So I'm going to add that to my alarms. And I think we'll wrap it up there. We've uh, launched a probe to Saturn. We launched a probe to Venus. We've got encounters with both. We might have something head to Uranus later, but uh, that's a 27 year trip, so who knows, we'll probably have something that can beat it to Uranus, uh, especially after we get to the the Voyager encounter, right? Uh, that one will probably be able to get to Uranus faster. So yeah, next time we will be trying to land Kerbals on the moon again, and so you can look forward to that. We are building those rockets, and that is my intention. Alright, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.